In 2008, a swimsuit got literally banned from the Olympics because they realized that athletes using it simply had an unfair advantage over the competition. Since every sport has its own ways to enhance the performance, I'm afraid that one question will be haunting the chess community forever. Where can you buy anal beads from? Look, I'm no expert in such technological discoveries, but I'm pretty confident that I've got a better and perhaps arguably less painful method to Scaracity rating. You know, of course, that I'm talking about the Jubava London. Not the Joe Biden London. Maybe the way some of you have played this opening, it kind of looks like a Joe Biden London. But uh, join me because today I'm going to be walking you through three games that I have played uh, on my speedrun account, facing opponents of an average rating of 2000. Now, I know 2000 may sound a little bit intimidating at first, especially if you are just getting started, but what really makes this opening a cheat code is that it genuinely works the same no matter what rating range uh, you find yourself into. So without wasting any more of your precious time, let's dive right into the games. All right, boys and girls, we are back facing almost 2100 rated opponent from Indonesia. Wow, dude, there are like so many chess players from Indonesia. <laughs> Uh, okay, place d5, meaning that we can uh, do our lovely little opening. Okay, starting position of the Jobava, he plays uh, c6 and then uh, bishop f5, okay, so a uh, bit of uh, an interesting pawn storm could be potentially, so I'm gonna start with f3, whenever the bishop lands on f5 and then, uh, let's see, knight f6 or e6, they normally do the knight, yeah. If uh, he plays e6, whenever they delay the knight move, it's uh, nice to play queen d2 long castle first and wait for the knight to land on f6 and only then storm him. Because then whenever he pushes like h5, you can play g5 and the knight gets uh, hit in the process as well. In this way, you get the most value out of the pawn storm. It's a bit of a really like rare spot. I'd say it happens around maybe like once out of like uh, six seven games um, normally uh, you will have both of these guys and now you get max value out of the pawn storm push g4 h4 uh, okay so i'm just gonna do h4 to give him uh, i'm not gonna take the free bishop i'm just gonna let him uh, go home so we can get the game and uh yeah then i'm gonna play uh, e3 and uh, do our normal thing he probably just uh, <laughs> broke the monitor of his PC, but realized the, the idiot he's playing didn't capture the bishop. I mean, <laughs> now he's trying to reconnect from the phone or something. Otherwise, I can't explain why he's making no moves, but uh, okay. Hopefully he's going to be back. <laughs> Hopefully he didn't just have a heart attack. Okay. All right. He is back. Bishop g6, so uh, e3. I'm not gonna rush with this push. I wanna keep uh, opportunity to go uh, g5 in the future and uh, recapture with a pawn, being annoying against the knight. Uh, of course, not immediately. We only do that once we long castle. So we're gonna be playing uh, long castle always in the pawn storm, pretty much. And uh, next move, we're gonna do bishop d3. Bishop d3 is a very nice move because we're developing, we're threatening to take on g6, more or less forcing him to take on d3, uh, which is gonna um, yeah, speed up our development a little bit. We're gonna recapture with the queen, making room for castling. Uh, yeah, I mean, he has to take. Come on, uh, Najib, no option on that. If you do anything like developing, then white is really like close to winning after takes and then queen d3, you just give yourself a isolated pawn for no reason. Just a very big weakness. Take the queen. Knight e2 castle. Uh, normally I prefer to start uh, knight e2 and then castle. It's like the most flexible way. But you can also start castling is not a mistake. Uh, he goes bishop d6 in the game. Just a quick mention, because I noticed this is like a common blind spot a lot of the low elo guys have after queen b6. Targeting the pawn, many people freak out and just go like rook b1. Because, uh, yeah, I guess for uh, a lot of the newer players, it's just uh, something in your brain that doesn't let you 
utilize the king for a defensive uh, task. But no, you can actually just long castle. The king perfectly defends b2. Long castle is also part of our plan. So queen b6 just ends up being a pointless move, misplaced since it's blocking black's uh, potential pawns that can push. So yeah, bishop d6 is a rule of thumb in the pawn storm. You're going to be able to recapture on f4 uh, with the knight. So I'm going to do knight e2. We play knight h3 only if uh, we don't want to block the bishop. So having he gone like bishop d6 in this position, let's say he made uh, two moves in a row, I would have done knight h3 not to block the bishop. I don't want to play knight e2 uh, if I don't have to. So bishop d6, I'm going to do knight closer to the center of the board. That is the most natural uh, move. And expecting queen c7 or takes, or maybe queen e7 as well. Uh, these are the main moves. Notice that he's unable to short castle. That would be uh, harakiri. I just have g5 uh, in that position. And after pawn takes, pawn takes, knight back, there's going to be a little bit of a surprise on h7. So uh, he goes queen c7. The point of this move is to go knight d7 while uh, not hanging the bishop. So we're going to long castle. And now uh, knight bd7 is going to be played. Uh, this is like universal spot that uh, you can reach. I had this like dozens of times. And uh, there are two ways of playing it. So the professional way, okay, best move. Like this is uh, best according to Stockfish. I, I, I won many games like this. You can take and then e4 is a very strong pawn sacrifice. Because after d, e, f, e, knight g4, you have e5 push. The queen has to move and then you get knight e4. And then the knight is about to plant on d6. It's very bad for black. But uh, my main recommendation for beginners, yeah, everybody that's like below 1800 is that, uh, okay, you don't need to remember these like crazy combos. You can just play simple g5. And now best move is knight h5 for black. And if they don't do it, I mean, black is borderline lost. And in low elo, very few people actually play knight h5, like maybe 20%, something insane like that. Of course, 2100 ELO guy out of elimination, he will sense that uh, allowing the open file is really bad because then the queen uh, infiltrates, winning this pawn on g7 most likely. And also going knight g8 is just terrible. I mean, g6 gets to open up his king. So he plays knight h5, yeah? Now, he's attacking my bishop. I don't want to let him uh, take, so we have to trade. We don't want to give uh, away bishops for the enemy knights in general as a rule of thumb. And okay, so we have push g5 and you want to remember this combo. You don't take. I mean, he just takes with a rook. That's no progress. So you push g5 so you can push g6. Threatening to mess up with this king. They normally push. Otherwise, yeah, castling, I guess it's playable, but you could take and then the rook is staring onto g7. It's pretty risky. Normally f5 is the most natural move, or even f6, sometimes they play, but f5 I expect the most. Uh, taking would be like resigning, because we just win the knight. And uh, yeah, other moves like e5, I guess, just uh, not a thing, because uh, you can take uh, on f7, and then the king is weak, or you can throw in a check. So he plays f5 like expecting. Now, you want to really remember, this is a typical combo, so you go... G5, targeting the knight. The knight moves. G6, he goes uh, F5. And then after F5, you have E4. Now, the whole reason why you do this, this uh, G5, G6 business is that the E6 square uh, will be quite vulnerable a lot of the times. Like uh, if they take, take, E5 could come, then the pawn is going to be a bit of a target. Also, additionally... What happens in these lines, he could easily get his knight trapped. Like, he should really bail out now with a knight f4 move or, uh, you know, as long as he can. Otherwise, uh, yeah, like, a common mistake would be to castle. I think he's really just lost if he castles. He has to jump on the opportunity train. Knight f4, yeah, force the knights off. I think we take and then we go king b1. This is pretty much uh, where, uh, yeah, kind of my model game begins for the upcoming course. This is a very com common position. I still had this many times already as white. Because it's very easy to uh, reach this position. 
So, uh, wow, he plays rook f8. Yeah, rook f8, kind of afraid to castle. Yeah, he wants to take with a rook to not open up e5, right? He is afraid to, like, take with a pawn. He doesn't want to do this because he's so check. He got scared. But he missed the main threat, yeah? Because it's very easy to lose awareness in this position because it's so random and nobody is really expecting this. Like, uh, I had similar motive in case you missed it. Uh, I trapped uh, even Faustino Oro in Blitz with this idea. So go e5 and it's already now maybe he starts realizing, but already uh, the evil has uh, has been done. Yeah, just uh, no way uh, back. He just uh, <laughs> drunk tested his ex, his, uh, ex girlfriend. Now situation is too embarrassing to like unsend or like. <laughs> You know, when you check somebody's profile and then you accidentally uh, like one of their like pictures from uh, three, four years ago. Pretty much what my opponent did with this Rook F8 move now. Uh, he's just going to get hit by F4 and then... Uh, yeah, guess what? I'm going to give this uh, as an exercise. Perhaps I should have already uh, asked you as an exercise. I kind of spoiled it a little bit because F4 makes it obvious. <laughs> But uh, f4, the point is, okay, I mean, what is the point of f4? Let's say your opponent goes queen e7 and then you go king b1. Yeah, let's say you make a bad move. Yeah, let's take this as an exercise backwards. Why is king b1 a bad move? You can try to think of that and this, this nuance will still help you in this position because if you give him time, black will be able to rescue the knight with f4. Sure, it's like not amazing. They will rescue the knight and probably lose a pawn, but they rescue the knight. So you play f4, stop any attempts of rescuing the knight, and now queen f3 is just getting ready to pick him up. Really no counterplay. <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah. It's pretty crazy, honestly, that you can just uh, apply simple template moves. Just... Uh, back engineer this structure to the point where uh, you get countless free wins like this. I mean, okay, he's going to sacrifice the knight, but the position is uh, hopefully going to win itself. I mean, this is the tricky part. Now I'm out of books, so I might as well start making stupid mistakes. But uh, with the extra piece, we should be able to bring this one uh, home. Now I'm actually starting to get nervous. What if I do something stupid? It would be such a nice game to spoil. Uh, okay, so c5. He's trying to open it up. Uh, that helps me because I have extra piece. But um, can we already infiltrate via d6? It's a double-edged sword. Because uh, cd, knight d6, king b8, we don't win uh, immediately. Or, or at least I don't see. And uh, if we take on d4, then he takes on e5 and my whole position collapses like a house of cards. So, uh, yeah, the tempting thing would be bad. Can I still do knight b5 and after take, stake with a knight? Sacrifice e5 with the argument that, okay, I can play maybe queen c3 check and then take. Ah, and then it's like a quadruple octopus fork. Yeah, we're gonna go for that. Octopus fork, I like. Not much into seafood, but... Octopus fork, I like. Okay, he just goes there. Strange. Uh, okay. The point with my move was also to prepare c3. So I can take back with a pawn and keep the center. Yeah, also this is the kind of position where uh, you may just be able to crash through with c4. Because after dc, maybe you just open it up with d5. Yeah, could be one of those positions. I guess I'm going to start a rookie one. Protecting e5 square should be should be useful. Uh, can he do a6 next? Then uh, I do like what? Knight d6? Takes, takes. Uh, I'm getting so nervous. Okay, I'm just going to play it simple like I initially wanted. Okay, I need to actually like really speed up. I'm just uh, sleeping on the position while my clock is ticking. It's better to sleep on the position while your opponent's clock is ticking. So a6, I'm going to plant it. 
that's the point. And then uh, the knight on d6 is going to be very strong because he cannot uh, destroy the base of my pawn chain anymore. And I can keep the knight protected by a pawn. And that's going to make his position really uh, more frozen than I am right now. It should really <laughs> turn off the AC. That's making me freezing. And yeah, he's thinking. It's good that uh, he slowed down, like his only chance in this position is to speed up. But yeah, rook c and I'm gonna get knight d6 with the tempo. And then I'm gonna do king b1. So he wants to take, but I want to be able to take back with a pawn, so I have to sidestep. And now no more knight e5, funny business, he's just uh, really lost. Okay, uh... Not super obvious how do we break through, like we have the extra piece, we're like completely winning. But uh, yeah, there should be at least like a piece sacrifice at some point to open up the whole thing. I think I'm gonna start rook c1. Prepare maybe this rook to d1 and then maybe have c4 ideas. So I want to open it up. Okay, so he goes knight c8 uh, trading. Right, makes some sense. Um... Uh, if I take, I'm bringing his rook, then I maybe take on twice on c5. How do I do this properly? Okay, so I'm gonna do this. So I'll let him take so that we get uh, pressure on e6. It's really like the easiest conversion of all time, but I'm just nervous because this is <laughs> such a nice opening. So he cannot take on h4 because the queen needs to protect e6. That's... Uh, Little point. And I might do h5 pretty soon, yeah, just to have the pawn protected. And there's always gonna be knight d5 motif, yeah, just to like sacrifice for two pawns, but then the game is easily won. But I think he is gonna make our job uh, easier. So you can try to pause the video and uh, find a pretty nice move right now. I think this is the moment where you have a nice move because there is knight d5 in the position. Okay, rook e5, maybe also not bad. Yeah, slow play, but knight d5. If rook d5, I take with a queen, and he's pinned. And otherwise, yeah, we managed to like really break through right now. Knight f4, go back. We have clear target. So, notice that the position opens up and we manage to trade his knight. Now, the fact that we have the extra piece, it really starts uh, to tell uh, even more. Okay, yeah, so he took on h4. This is a threat. Uh, I cannot take because of rook d5, so I have to move the knight, I imagine. Uh, Queen f4 also moved to force the winning endgame. Takes, takes, enter winning endgame. Knight f4 also, simple move that's winning. Okay, I'm gonna do knight f4. So yeah, I wanted to say that uh, this is why, uh, in general, when you have both material advantage and also strategic advantage, the trades uh, are in your favor. Because imagine uh, that uh, somebody farts in uh, public transport, right? Like if it's crowded, full of people, you have no way to catch the bus start. But <laughs> if you're only like two people inside the bus, then it becomes like really obvious who did it. That's how obvious it will become that we have the knight. That's, you know, an extra piece and we should uh, have easy conversion. Okay, so Queen F6, can I like try to infiltrate? I'm gonna do that. Try to infiltrate and back rank. And he's gonna be overloaded. It feels like at least. Uh, so he's gonna do queen e7. That's for sure. Do we have a clever move in that position? I maybe just take advantage of the pin. Yeah, queen e7 is gonna do to stop c7 and now I have maybe d5. Ah, he has uh, rook c6 that I missed. Uh, okay, maybe just queen e3. So trade rooks and keep pressure. Did the queen just came from e3? It doesn't matter. Why are you asking? Okay, 40 seconds left. I'm so nervous. I don't know why. <laughs> this is like really the easiest conversion of all time, but... Okay. Uh, uh, this is on the cards. There's not much you can do to stop it. Also, now this is on the cards. 
Bro, this is on the cards as well. Okay, I'm just taking. Oh man, I'm so nervous. Don't think I'd be uh, so nervous even if I played Magnus. That's how uh, badly I don't want to spoil this game. 30 seconds. Okay, Rook D6, but then Queen C3, no? Queen C3 should be nice. And if Rook C6, I have Queen G3 check. Okay, this is good. And Rook E8, I have uh, check. Oh my god, this is gonna have such a nice finish if he goes Rook E8. But he's gonna do Rook D6. This guy isn't silly. Oh, never mind, he is. That's a free rook. That's a free rook right there. That's a check. Can I really force queens off somehow? I don't see it. But I'm just gonna be annoying. I'm gonna do this move, which is most likely gonna force a trade. Just kidding. I'm gonna take the pawn. We're almost promoting. Uh, okay, so back. Offer queen trade. Try to go g7. Okay, go g7. What can go wrong? Have to sidestep the check. Then check and promote with mate. Yeah, pretty simple procedure. Nice. Nice, 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 nice. Okay. <laughs> Got him with the rook promotion mate. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, just wanted to show that rook e8 had a very beautiful finish. <laughs> Would have gone check. And this is one of the really first patterns that uh, you learn in chess. It goes king b8 and then you have uh, the double check. So now his only move is to go there. And uh, this is where uh, you get him in the uh, classical smother mate. So you go queen b8. Has to take and then king is uh, sealed in a box. And uh, the horse uh, delivers the uh, final blow. So yeah, now... One thing that gets overlooked quite easily is the fact that the end games are insanely good for white. So this is going to be the topic of the next game. Let's dive right in. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we managed to get ourselves uh, another white game. Uh, let's open it up uh, with D4. And uh, we're facing a 2000 rated opponent from Indonesia. Uh, Place D5 already. Uh, Signal that uh, we're gonna be allowed to play uh, the Jubafa London. He goes uh, early bishop onto f5. Uh, so keep in mind uh, the pawn storm. But first, uh, I'm not gonna do f3 yet. I wanna get the starting position of the Jubafa London. So the starting position, you get uh, knight bishop out, then you play f3. So you don't wanna do it too early. And okay, so he plays uh, c6. This is an interesting setup. He is going for uh, delaying knight moves. Uh, also, in case he would have played uh, bishop d6, uh, I would have gone for simple uh, queen d2. Protect the bishop and then look forward to expand long castle. On c6, uh, yeah, I think we're just gonna... We could go for the push. Also... There could be a small uh, detail that uh, he's going to have uh, h5. And if I push, it no longer comes with a tempo. So, okay, for that reason, I think I'm just going to go uh, queen d2. But also bear in mind that uh, the drawback of uh, not developing your knights, which is what my opponent is doing, is that it allows uh, a quick e4. And white could uh, step in the center. Uh, that would be the best move, uh, objectively. Shall we go for it? I mean, queen d2 is super thematic, but e4 is kind of really the uh, biggest punishment. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna do, let's say, simple move. I'm gonna wait for him to play knight f6, and then I'm gonna start. Storming, other than that, we just long castle. If he takes, I take. If he goes, I mean, queen c7, fine. And then I'm gonna be taking and then, uh, yeah, taking an e4 if he's really forcing my hand. But he goes knight f6, and now I'm gonna go on storm him uh, effectively. h4, and on h5, g5 comes with a tempo which really makes uh, quite an important difference other than 
g5. If his knight was already on g8, he would have saved the tempo, just develop easily, knight e7, play around my pawn storm. But now I get the tempo. So he either takes or goes uh, onto the initial square. It's bad to go to h7. Some people make that mistake. The knight really has no future uh, on h7. So yeah, he goes for the d7 plan. And we get a bit of a typical position, let's say. The only thing is that uh, our queen on f4 is a little bit exotic. It's like our queen is uh, suddenly on vacation. Should be on d2 normally, but f4, not a bad uh, square. I could consider queen d6 just to be mega annoying, stopping castling and uh, inviting him to play some endgame, which I think I'm going to do. I want to show you guys that uh, there is actually a lot of potential for uh, the Jubava endgames. And uh, yeah, he goes for it uh, kind of immediately because uh, there weren't really many other options. Uh, you cannot just leave with a win on d6 hanging on top of your head like a Damocles sword. So yeah, take this way. Now I have e3, I have e4 as a move. Try to take more space. I also have uh, knight h3 heading towards f4. Um, yeah, there's no really way to stop e5. So I think I'm just going to start knight h3 with a trick in mind that uh, if we play knight f4 and he goes bishop f5, we could really benefit from uh, having delayed the pawn, uh, the pawn push and we get e4 in uh, one, uh, one go. So now b5, okay, b5 is a move, but really kind of hit in the desert, not doing much. Knight f4 uh, threatening to give him uh, double pawns. And yeah, the problem is bishop h7 kind of lets uh, h5 undefended. Plus, yeah, now bishop f5. Can we do what I was thinking a move ago? He'll probably have to take and then do bishop g4. Maybe in that position we can uh, finally finish development. Bishop e2. Imagine a trade of bishops happening. We take with uh, maybe c knight. So we can transfer it to g3, attack h5. Yeah, that looks good enough to me. Just simple moves, simple tempo moves, thematic maneuvers. Get a knight to f4, pressure the bishop. He keeps the bishop and uh, yeah, okay, he makes it interesting. This this was uh, a possibility that I didn't mention, but uh, my first instinct was that takes, takes, and then takes on e6. He's going to be having a bit of a backward pawn. So he wanted to avoid uh, us having two lonely pawns in the center, because that's usually just a dominating uh, position. And he wants to do it in a tactical manner, and I have to take, because notice... It's not like I can move the knight. If I move the knight right now, uh, he could have taken twice um, on e4. I mean, sure, we have some compensation, but it's unnecessary to lose a pawn. So, yeah, we have this. And, uh, okay, really simplest move would be bc. But that allows e5, and it's not clear. So we have to double down and take with tempo. He's going to take on b2. And, okay, what do you play? Do you instantly recapture? Capturing is probably fine since we're not going to get mated, but there is also another interesting concept that we could do king b1. And uh, we could try to make the argument that his rooks are not going to be able to get an attack against our king because we can use this as a so-called umbrella pawn on b2. The only thing that I'm afraid of is whether... He can uh, ever get like a knight to a4 that's threatening to really get under my skin via c3, which seems quite likely. So I think I'm just going to take here. No need for the umbrella opponent. Okay, yeah, what to do? Like you're under big pressure, you take, right? I mean, otherwise, why just takes on f7 and white is up a pawn? But he takes and now suddenly... Uh, <laughs> He just uh, dropped his phone uh, on his face while laying in bed. <laughs> this is going to be uh, really painful. On IG6, just collect rook. Okay, we didn't even get to show the, uh, the Bava endgame, sadly. He's just, um, yeah, just apply. 
tiny a bit pressure, just uh, push the acceleration button just a little bit. And, uh, you know, play solid, push the acceleration uh, button just, just a touch. And uh, yeah, it's going to be enough to <laughs> win most of these 2000 ELO games. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just going to rescue my knight. I mean, have clean extra rook. He cannot do knight a6 because the bishop covers it. He's going to play knight d7, but I'm going to trade. Now, uh, okay, he keeps playing on. Uh, I'm just going to finish development. <laughs> I was a little bit behind in development just because I have more uh, <laughs> more pieces than him. <laughs> and uh, yeah, trade. Bring rooks to open files. Okay, what is an open file here? So if this look like an looks like an open file, but he has a pawn on e6 that's restricting it. It's semi open file yeah, to be precise. So the real open file is b file, right? So we need to penetrate using that file. So I'm gonna do king c3. King a1 is fine as well, but uh, king c3 or king is gonna be a bit more useful into the end game. Imagine the king, look, it just protects uh, the pawn. We get immediately, immediately rewarded for that. Plus, it also had ideas to maybe uh, infiltrate. So remember that the king can be used as an attacking piece in the endgame. And uh, yeah, I could continue with rook b1, but that gives him c4. It's not really a problem as the bishop can uh, find, uh, find a job, basically. <laughs> the bishop is not going to be jobless. It's going to yeah, work remotely from h3, targeting the e6 pawn. And yeah, he attacks. Uh, I have king d4, try to keep the pawn, but I'm just going to do rook on the open file, saying that, fine, you can have c5, you can have a bite, but I'm going to get the whole burger. I'm going to go rook b7. That's like really infiltrating and also dominating the knight. Now bring all uh, your heavy pieces on open file and then just... Or trades. Rook b8 is next move, no matter what. Even if I have mate in one, I'm go not gonna do it. I'm gonna play a rook b8 to trade. This is uh, yeah, pretty much how it's done here. Uh, yeah, okay, maybe he tries to rescue the knight finally, but that at least drops the pawn. I'll still probably do rook b8. And uh, okay, if d4, king can easily go to d2. Yeah, okay, gonna do that. I'm not gonna interrupt the rooks. The king stays... Perfectly placed in the uh, middle of the board in the end game. And yeah, this coming next. Okay, a5. So yeah, a5, basically he's saying that uh, he can avoid trade, but no, you cannot because then the knight is going to be undefended. Plus, I can also do rook b7 in that position. And <laughs> if I'm really like, uh, want to piss him off, I can play rook b7 and still trade his rook. Which is something that, okay, if you get good at this skill, then... Your conversion rate uh, will skyrocket. Uh, okay, I can do check, pick up the pawn. I can pick up this pawn. Yeah, I don't know what to do. I just feel like uh, a cat that's uh, inside the house full of uh, open boxes. I don't know what to do. Everything is so nice. Can I just get a queen, please, opponent? And okay, he resigns. Nice, nice, nice. Oh, yeah, I mean, nothing really special. Uh, we got uh, an interesting version of the pawn storm where he delayed knight f6. And then uh, this detail in the opening was quite important that uh, we waited for him to play knight f6 so that we can get the pawn storm with a tempo. Uh, that is, uh, okay, usually if you do it too fast, you can get stuck. Uh, it was a bit of a niche... Uh, niche position honestly like the vast majority of players will go knight f6 very quickly and you can pawn storm uh, uh, with uh, let's say getting the full benefits out of it but yeah if you do it here just to quickly show for everybody yeah like h5 if you do g5 then okay i mean you can play bishop d6 and then knight e7 and the pawn storm uh, doesn't really hit anybody in the process so uh yeah, queen d2, I think you can do this small adjustment and then, uh, okay, knight f6 now, look at it, how pretty the pawn storm it is. <laughs> and this endgame should be like tiny better. Now, apart from the fact that this is going to be one of the nicest games that I have ever played, 
It's gonna showcase uh, how to play when uh, you're not allowed to do the pawn storm. And plus, the end of the game has a bit of an unexpected finish. Let's dive right in. Alright everybody, we are back and uh, we got a 1900 opponent uh, from Egypt. From Egypt, never mind, and uh, we're gonna be uh, Joe bava -ing. Uh, he plays d5, meaning that we can Jobava. So whenever you have pawn on d5, that uh, enables the Jobava London. If he plays without pawn on d5, uh, well, that's going to give you opportunity to take over the center. So, uh, plays e6. And uh, very important, you want to get started by playing e3 first. Do not do the knight. If you're doing the knight, uh, you're going to get food poisoning. So play e3, and you're not going to be getting uh, food poisoning ever. Now, the point with e3 is that, well, you're staying flexible. And after bishop b4, uh, you want to do e3, bishop d3 first to avoid uh, the mistake of going knight f3 because knight e4 happens. And then uh, there's going to be such an uh, annoying pin that... Uh, you may actually get food poisoning, so avoid that. Play bishop d3 first uh, on bishop b4. And when the knight goes there, you can at the very least take. Or you can go knight e2 as well. Just to clarify the move order, because uh, most people go wrong simply because they don't pay attention to the move order. Now, bishop d6. Bishop d6, bishop d6. Uh, what do we do? The point is, I don't want to go bishop d3 because that's really not doing anything unless they take. So instead, remember, just simple rule. e3, bishop d3, no matter what they do. Let him take. And uh, we're gonna get uh, what I like to call the boa constrictor. Boa snake structure. Uh, because uh, this is really gonna come down to pretty much a positional squeeze. So we're gonna try to like constrict our opponent, so, so to say. And uh, yeah, normally in the boa snake, you always go knight f3 short castle, but he goes knight bd7. So knight f3 is uh, really the most common mistake that I see in the position being made because you're not paying attention to what your opponent is trying to do. So black is trying to go c5. And whenever they push, uh, they're threatening to push c4, disturbing the bishop, you want to go dc. But the issue is that they can take back with the knight and then that's gonna pretty much tackle the bishop and black is gonna equalize. So you see that he's uh, willing to do c5. We're gonna start with this knight e2 move. And you see another advantage of having started with bishop to d3 on the previous move because it makes this move possible without blocking the bishop. So we can do knight e2. And now you just solved all your opening problems. C5, you're just going to be in time with C3. And other than that, we play Knight F3 Castle. And I'm spending a lot of time to explain this little detail, but really, if you get this part, the rest is just going to be uh, incredibly easy. So it does A6, we don't care. We play Knight F3 Castle anyways. And on C5, yeah, just don't take because uh, the whole purpose is to be able to keep this bishop. So if you take, he gets easy access to it. So I'm just going to do c3. If c4, we're happy to keep it on this diagonal. After the pawn takes, uh, as a rule of thumb, we avoid isolated pawn as long as uh, we can. Notice that the pawn on d4 uh, is isolated since it cannot be protected by, by any other white pawns. So we have to take with one of the knights. Now, which knight do you capture with? Well... The key idea is we use this knight because this knight could potentially improve. So we want to use both knights for the central squares if possible. Now we castle. If knight c5, uh, you have important uh, fundamental move. He's probably going to play knight c5. Um, okay, he's just delaying it. But in general, you always want to watch out and uh, keep the bishop. You have no idea how common this mistake goes unnoticed. People just... Uh, don't really value their bishops enough. So, you know, you should really keep your bishop at all costs if you can. He goes b5 and, uh, yeah, many moves. 
Crew Key 1, simple uh, developing move, placing Rook on the file. I could also do Queen E2. Idea to play for like Knight E5 in the future. I think I'm going to start with uh, Queen E2 here. Um, yeah, pretty much uh, anything is playable as long as you put Queen on E2 uh, and then Rooks are coming to open files. Rooks go to the center and whenever you think uh, about uh, where to put the rooks, this is uh, really a pro tip. You don't want to think about like a singular rook. Whenever you move one of your rooks, you want to think about, okay, where is its brother going? So you don't want to be like rook d1 and then this guy is stuck. So first you notice open files. We don't have any of uh, our own pawns on those files, meaning that our rooks are going to be active. So... Naturally, these are going to be the squares. Place queen c7. Attacking the pawn. Okay, okay, okay. What do we do? Now, g3 is a simple way to protect. I can also do knight e5. Stopping that uh, attack. Which, yeah, if he takes, he's going to improve my pawn structure. I think we're going to go knight e5. Happy to take back with a pawn. He probably shouldn't be taking, but it's common for them to trade. If knight c5, same idea. I want to keep the bishop, so I'm just going to do bishop c2. Uh, I wouldn't play bishop b1 in that position because the rook is stuck. So if I had rook d1, it's interesting to play knight c5, bishop b1. Hide the bishop all the way. Uh, maybe set up a queen battery. But yeah, not by blocking the rook. And he goes knight e8. Knight e8 is a bit weird. On knight e8, uh, your first instinct should be okay. Can we go for any Greek gifts? Because this is why you're actually better in the boa snake. You're only better in this pawn structure as long as you can keep uh, bishops on the board. Because uh, the enemy bishop is bad. As long as uh, you have a bishop that gives you free attack, you're better. So the only idea for black to equalize would be to exchange this bishop. Which, yeah, by the way, he played it. Bishop is completely dead. So uh, we should be comfortably better. I don't see an immediate attack happening though. So I'm just going to start with rook d1. And uh, yeah, if knight c5, maybe then bishop b1. If f6, that's tempting me. That's going to be tempting for the attack. But uh, yeah, he decides to take. I'm going to improve my pawn structure. I'm not going to take with the queen because it's not guaranteed that he takes. So I want to like really cash in the improved pawn. So... I don't want to go for a situation where he might improve our pawns. No, I just want to improve it for sure. So I'm just going to take with a pawn. And then, uh, okay, we're entering another interesting uh, phase of this attack. Now that you take, uh, it's time to push f4. f4 with plan for f5 break. Um, okay, he goes g6. Probably preparing knight g7. Uh, we don't really uh, care about it that much. Uh, we just need to pretty much figure out whether we try to play uh, ultra aggressive g4 f5 or we try to go in for like a rook lift. That is another uh, perk of having the extra space. We could actually consider uh, a rook swing over the third rank. So like uh, let's say maybe even rook f3, rook h3 and then some queen moves. Queen f2, queen h4 to attack. We could also consider like a positional squeeze. The thing is my opponent really doesn't have any counterplay. So we can take this slow. Uh, like a3 for instance as a move to fix these pawns is always nice. Yeah I'm just gonna do a3. I think in general it's kind of a nice move to let your opponent go wrong. So yeah see immediately he goes f5 where I can basically take and now he's gonna have a backward pawn. So Surely he was not forced to do it, but in general, this is a great practical tip. You just make like useful move in general, flexible, uh, and he instantly made his position much worse. So just going to defend. And we have a typical uh, range structure, uh, typical uh, good against bad bishop. Ideally, I would like to swap my bishop for his knight and just play against his bad piece. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to do... Even queen e5 is interesting, but that gives me isolated pawn. Could be interesting though to speed up the uh, attack. 
Okay, what do we do? I think I'm gonna go Queen E5 just because I don't have a lot of time on the clock and I wanna make the game a little bit more forcing. Uh, I should have uh, gone for Rook E1 and then play a slower squeeze, but I think this one is interesting enough as well. Because I don't see a way for Black to attack the E5 pawn because the Knight is misplaced and on Knight F5 I'm immediately taking with a Bishop. I'm gonna keep this scenario with a good Knight against bad Bishop if possible. Now, I was considering him to play rook f8, but probably we can just go for the swap and then bring the king. Imagine if our king can just uh, slide over the queen side. That would be instantly winning. But I mean, it's okay. If we trade rooks, it's uh, perhaps quite achievable. Goes rook b8. Once a5. Uh, yeah, possible. I could do b4, but that's uh, weakening c3. How do I make progress? Probably just bring the king. And uh, on a5, I might be playing a sneaky move. I think we're gonna go for a sneaky move. Should I play sneaky move in that position? I don't know, you guys tell me. On a5, it was interesting. Okay, knight f5, remember, this is great positional mistake. It gives me this... Um, F4 less push, and notice that the more pieces you trade, the more obvious uh, it will become that uh, there is this problem for my opponent that he has a bad bishop. Like, uh, okay, whenever you have this situation where uh, opponent has a weakness, it becomes uh, more obvious the more pieces you trade in general. So, uh, yeah, he wants rook a2. How do I... Uh, Watch out for that. There's also maybe g4 idea. Hmm. I think I'm gonna start uh, with this move. And then I just wanna like protect these pawns and perhaps uh, infiltrate this way. Could also use the knight to make his rook passive. I'm gonna be better, but not clear if uh, enough to really win. But as long as my king gets to break through, yeah. The king is, uh, as I said, like if we could get it, his bishop is unable to really challenge any of this activity. I just need to watch out for rook c8 incoming. What shouldn't be a problem. Remember that in the end game, you want to use your king like uh, it's genuinely Manuel Neuer. <laughs> so king goes to b6, then maybe like knight to c5. Could also, okay, I cannot do knight d4 yet. Actually, where is my king going? <laughs> Good question. I cannot move uh, anything yet. Guess I'm gonna go all the way to b6. And uh, okay, looking for knight c5, and if he takes, probably we should be able to win his bishop. Because his bishop is gonna be very passive. So yeah, knight c5, if check king c7. Oh man, this king is gonna be like so annoying. I think it, we're entering territory where the position gets uh, close to winning. Yeah, now he gave me open file. We have strong knight against bad bishop. We're threatening to play rook a7 and if he gets pinned, uh, I will have uh, ideas to liquidate into winning king and pawn end game. Yeah, I'm gonna play tempo move and then king b7. He cannot check as the rook drops and still threatening rook a7 and then uh, king b6. Same problem for uh, my opponent. Uh, yeah. Gonna do it. Yeah, h4, but king b6 simply. And he's gonna have to do rook d8, but that uh, allows me to liquidate into winning endgame, I think. Yeah, so checks me, but king a5 simply. And then we exchange. And important, just do not take on h4. Because if you take on h4, he's going to get past the uh, pawn. But if you ignore it, then you're going to have easy win. So he has to play rook here to like not lose the bishop, but then we have uh, easily winning king and pawn end game. So yeah, that's a typical kind of little squeeze uh, in uh, these French bishop typical uh, positions. Taking with check, intermediate move, and then recapturing. He's really uh, lost right now. And, uh, yeah, should be in time to convert easily with 30 seconds, but uh, you never know. <laughs> you never know with me. 
sometimes uh yeah 30 seconds in general more than enough for me <laughs> uh okay he takes come on go to the middle so i can mate uh okay he does not want to i guess i'm gonna take the pawns I should uh, seriously think about ways to win this game and uh, stop making stupid jokes, but I think the pawn is pushing. I think the pawn is pushing. The kids are eating. This is looking pretty good. B6, B7. Yeah, I should have tried maybe to push the F pawn, but this is gonna be too slow. But okay, guys, you're gonna see a rook. Uh, you're gonna see a rook checkmate. Do you guys know how to mate with a rook? Kind of doubt, but I'm gonna show you. 15 seconds. Let's see if we can get it. So I'm gonna have to use uh, the rook to cut his king, and then uh, the biggest theme uh, in these positions is that we'll have to make a waiting move. That usually goes uh, unnoticed. So I'm going to try to... Oh. Uh-oh. Check me. Don't check me there. Ah, mother flagger. Ah, dude. Come on! You know when you hit your little toe on some random furniture? That one still hurts. Um, anyways, just a little update about the course. If you uh, want to get uh, notified uh, whenever the course will be ready or you want to receive some updates, uh, subscribe to this, this newsletter. You just need to type your email, um, no credit card uh, info asked or anything like that. Uh, you can use the link uh, from the comments or go to alexbanzea.com. Thanks everybody for uh, watching it all the way till the end. And uh, yeah, hopefully I'll see you around the channel. Have a good one.